yeah, maybe, maybe we should be training people more like athletes. And I think it's just because the way athletics is set up, it rewards that kind of model. But I mean, why wouldn't we want to have like our HR managers at a big Fortune 500 com- a company engaged in some kind of hiring tournament where you're like scoring your hire, scoring the people you re- you like rejected and you're getting some kind of score and then you're doing some kind of practice mock interviews where you're working on your interview skills and, you know, ho- why don't we do that? We don't do that. But why don't we do that? You know, we could do that. Scott, I, it's crazy because you were someone I, I watched or rather read when I didn't have a podcast, when I was just searching in life, f- trying to figure out the next thing that I was going to do with my life. I picked up Ultra Learning and it was a very impactful book because I was like, oh, there's a guy out there who also likes learning and who went through the every step on how to learn effectively. And then to talk to you today here, it's an awesome experience and I'm, I'm grateful for it. I, we have any before we recorded, I just felt like an instant connection to you. So I'm really oh, grateful well, thank for you. you. Being here. Well, I, I always like talking about it. This is like my lifelong obsession. So anyone who's willing to sit down and like chat with me for like an hour and a half on it is good in my books. I, I'm curious, kind of, we'll get to the, mm-hmm. the learning stuff, but I'm curious before sure. we get into that, how would you rank your level of peace on a scale of one to 10? My level of peace? Yeah. Oh, um, uh, like inner peace, I'm guessing. Like I'm not involved in any active war, like conflict right now. So that level of peace, I'm pretty good. Um, I would say it's fairly high. I think I'm my personality is like I I like kind of inherently tend to be a more anxious person than like a relaxed person. Like if you know they're like the type A type B. I'm more type A than type B. Um, but I think you know from from just being aware of that i'm also aware of like in general my life is pretty good pretty calm i'm 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 very happy with it so i would rank it fairly high although with the with the caveat that you know if you take people out i'm like less on the mellow yellow side a little bit more on the intense side which if you've read ultra like, you probably gathered about me <laughs> yeah i i think it's interesting because i was reading through your 35 year old reflection post mm. and you mentioned something really interesting, which was that you were, it was, you had had all these experiences in the previous year. Like yeah. you had children and you had <laughs> yeah. new, new responsibilities at work and new writing assignments and yeah. all this stuff. And yet you were more at peace than you expected in some yeah. way. Well, and that so, was interesting so learning. just to like give background context Please. so people have any Please. idea what we're talking about. So yes. in the last uh, like year, I had uh, had a new baby. So I have a, I have a three and a half year old and now currently half year old, but it was a new baby in May, in, um, in February. And I had a book due in May and it turned out to be a challenging book for me to write. I, uh, we can talk about ultra learning. I have another book coming out, but it was like one of those things where like I had already put all my ideas in ultra learning. So it was like clean slate. I was doing this like huge, huge research project. So it really was a stretch project for me. And then my wife and I, on top of that, we also bought a new house. So we were like moving a new baby, you got a book and this kind of thing. And so, you know, kind of going back to my like being an anxious person, I'm also someone who, you know, when I'm anticipating something, I'm often worrying about it, right? But then when you're actually doing it, uh, you just kind of get into the flow of like, okay, just do this, do this, do this. And then it, you know, it happens. And so that's a, I don't know, I think it's a general truth about life that anxiety is kind of invariably future oriented. Like when things are actually happening to you in the moment, um, I mean, they can be stressful, but you're usually dealing with them. Whereas, you know, worries and anxieties are like, okay, what's going to happen then? What's going to happen? You know, this kind of thing. Whereas when you're just, okay, I'm just dealing with it right now. You just deal with it. I think that's true for a lot more of life than we really think about. Like you have this quote here from that post that I'm talking about, which is linked below, which is reality rarely reflects our anticipations of it. And if you think about how often people will have this idea to start a podcast or start a business (laughs) or be in a relationship, whatever it is, it's so rarely what you think it is before doing it, which I find fascinating. Well, I think uh, simulating reality is really hard, you know, and I think that um, 
Well, two things I would say about one is that this kind of goes back to um, Daniel Kahneman's work where he was talking about like the experiencing and the remembering self. So um, I, I don't have a good like link for that, but he, he talks, that was a sort of section of his research career where he was talking about how, you know, when you do happiness research, you ask people what makes them happy and this kind of stuff. And then you do surveys where you like interrupt them during the day and see how happy they are. It turns out that those things have like nothing to do with each other. So if you're sort of like, what, what, you know, what makes your life good? What makes you like uh, subjectively evaluate your life and be like, you know, life is good. I'm happy versus how do you feel right now? And you like interrupt people. They just have totally different um, bases. And I, I think part of it is just that when we're in the kind of remembering mode or the sort of thinking about our life broadly mode, uh, we're just very bad at anticipating how we're going to feel in certain circumstances. And I think this goes to like the idea of anxiety is that it's sort of an adaptive emotion to like prepare. Okay, I need to prepare for something. Um, and sometimes it's not helpful for that. So I don't want to say it's always adaptive, but that's its function. Whereas when you're in the situation, you're like, there's no pre preparing anymore. You just have to deal with it, right? So you don't feel anxious because <laughs> you actually have to do things. And um, so I think there's a lot of places where we we're kind of hardwired to misjudge how we're going to experience things just because when you're in an anticipation mode, you're kind of in a fundamentally different psychological state than when you're dealing with stuff. Um, you know, I think there's also a relationship with like, uh, yeah, things, things where you think something's going to make you really, really happy too. Like you imagine achieving some goal and it's going to make you feel like eternally fulfilled and grateful and whatever. And then like two weeks later, you're back to normal. Um, or even just like, if you ask people who are of like a moderate income, like, what do you think it's going to be like to be really rich? Now I'm not really rich, but I know some really, really rich people. And you'd be surprised like how little it matters. Like it makes a big difference, it, difference for some things. And, you know, certainly you eliminate some stresses in life. So that can't be discounted. But if you thought you would just be like, oh, just like sitting back and just feeling awesome all the time, uh, you know, it's maybe like 10% or something that makes you feel a little better than you would before. And I know a lot of people who are rich who are also miserable too. So I think it's one of those things that we just have a hard time anticipating how things are going to make us feel because our feelings are designed to take us, help us take action and not like just simulate our future selves. What do you think has made the biggest difference in making you feel awesome that you didn't expect would make you feel awesome? Um, hmm. That's hard. Uh, that I didn't expect would make, cause now I have to like go back and like rewind the clock and think, um, I, you know, this is a weird thing to say, but I really like being married. <laughs> when I was single, I think there was a lot of, again, the anxiety about like picking the right person, like, you know, okay, like I'm going to be with this person and you want the relationship to last. And, and you also see people who have stresses in their relationship, but, um, I'm just, I think my personality is really well suited to being like married as opposed to when I was single. So I, I just, I enjoy that part. Um, I think what other things make me happier than I anticipated, um, I can't think of anything right now, but I'm sure there's some that will come up to me later. Yeah. Feel free to bring them up if it comes yeah. back later. Cause I am interested in that, but you bring up the marriage piece yeah. and <laughs> you have this, you have this great, uh, blog post, 18 life lessons for eight, oh, for your yeah. 18 year old self. And the first one you, you say is you'll have more dating success if you strive to be relaxed rather than confident. And I love that idea. And I think it's so, it's it's not talked about enough. And it's so true from my experience. Well, keep in mind, I've been out of the dating game for like almost a decade now. So I'm maybe not in the best place to be giving people dating advice. But my my experience was, and I'm not someone, if you if you can't tell by it, by talking talk to me here, I'm not like, you know, natural, like super what ladies killer kind of thing. I'm a sort of a nerdy guy and this sort of thing. So I think I'm someone who would have been like, what is a good way to interact with women when I was younger? This was a kind of advice I consume. And if you look online, the advice is just terrible. Like, it's just like, there's just whole sections of like, you know, vaguely a salty kind of advice. And then there's other things where you just like, do, like, does that work? That seems like you'd look like a total jackass doing that. And, and I think part of it is that there's a lot of insecurity. So especially, 
you know, if you are someone who's just like not like every single person you talk to loves you because you're so, you know, tall and good looking. If if you're in that kind of position, I think there is this advice that like, well, women like men who are really confident and you see men who are really confident and they seem to get a lot of women. And so you're kind of like, oh, I should try to project that. But projecting confidence when you're not confident is kind of bad advice. Like counterintuitively, you are almost never able to project confidence when you're not confident. Um, but I think you can project like, okay, like trying to just be like more relaxed, I think is a, is a better advice here because I think that's often, you know, from talking to women and stuff, that's often what they find unappealing is that, you know, just, they're just too much that, you know, you just kind of like, okay, let yourself just be yourself and then let the person evaluate you and don't, don't be so, you know, kind of wound up about it. And I think that's hard. That's also hard advice to execute. It's hard to be relaxed when you're not relaxed, but I think it's more achievable. Like it's easier to imagine yourself being stressed out, like taking calm rest and like calming down than it is to just like simulate, like what does a confident person act like? Because I think very often those, again, those mental simulations are wrong. And, you know, we're talking about dating advice, but I think this is true writ large that like there's often a kind of in, you know, entrepreneurial circles, fake it until you make it. You got to seem like you're the most confident entrepreneur in the world, this kind of thing. And I don't think that's true either. Um, I think that's also mistaken advice. And I don't know, maybe someone's going to call me out on this and just be like, you know what? You're wrong, Scott. Uh, you shouldn't be doing this. But I mean, I go on podcasts and I think like you know, I, I've had this experience of talking to people about like my project. And I've, I felt like the trying to be really confident is like the worst possible advice for being relatable in like an interview and this kind of thing. Like just, just be truthful about yourself, be interested in the things you're interested in, be passionate about it. And I think that often comes across way better than, you know, I have to like project something that is not there internally, but that's uh that's neither here nor there. That's a little, little, thing that I would tell myself if I were 20. Okay, don't do that. Yeah, well, it, it speaks to the importance of being comfortable in your own skin, in your own yep. body and mind. And if you can be comfortable in your own body and mind, you'll be relaxed and you'll probably be confident. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. But if you're comfortable with yourself, by yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think I think the other thing too is just that, uh, like, again, there's a bit of a... Uh, like there is that catch 22 that like what what confident people are actually like is what is what you would be like if you were just relaxed about things like it's kind mm. of it's a, it's one of those things where um it's like if you're golfing or something and and someone tells you okay you want to do this like full swing but you're not actually swinging it all the way through and so you have to imagine yourself doing something that's like it feels wrong, but it's the, actually the right way to do it. Um, and so I think there's a lot of things that are like that where you have to kind of maybe aim at a bit of a different target because your interpretation of the correct thing is going to like lead you astray. And so I think this is one of those things where if you wanted to actually look more confident that being more relaxed makes you seem more confident. I think it's a little bit like, you know, public speaking and stuff is like that too, that uh, everyone thinks that they're like, oh, like everyone's going to see how anxious I am. And actually no one sees that. And so you'll sometimes see speakers who are doing a good job and then they start talking about how anxious they are and how scared they are of being up there. And it's like, I wasn't aware that you were feeling that until you just said it. And so I think, you know, the the idea that like every little slip up you make is like super visible to the audience is, is actually, it's not there. And so if you can just be relaxed and you can just take pauses whenever you want, um, it feels uncomfortable for you, but to the audience, it, it probably feels normal. So sometimes there's these little areas in life where like to improve at a skill, um, you have to aim at a target that feels wrong, but is, you know, it's, it's actually going to get you closer in, in reality to the right direction and related to our previous idea of like simulating reality in our heads. Yeah. I mean, you've tackled so many different areas of learning and I w when I really tried to like synthesize what it is you're trying to do with your website, your courses, <laughs> everything. I'd like to know what you did because I don't know either. <laughs> you're trying to help yeah. people be better human beings. Thank you. How does I that think, resonate? I think, you know, for me, you know, I'll, I'll say what I'm doing and then you can tell me what you think I'm doing. Um, my whole goal with like writing my was because I've been doing it now for like half my life, like 17 years has always just been to write about the things that interest me and write about what I like to read. And so that's a weird kind of way to look at it sometimes because, you know, everyone has to have like a topic. You need to have a brand. You need to like, that's how everyone does things. And I've just felt like 
you know, like kind of going back to our original thing, like if you just aim at like do stuff that you think is interesting, like I think this is cool. I think this is interesting. I want to talk about this. Then you kind of end up having a brand. You end up having it because you just, you can't not have a perspective on things. You can't not be a certain kind of unique person. So um, I think self-improvement has always been a recurring theme. I always try to keep my essays and writing a little bit more pragmatically focused. That's a little bit of a gravitational well that I, I, I sink in towards. But I think, you know, writing about learning, like I write a lot about learning because I'm really interested in learning and it's just been a recurring theme. I think if I weren't interested in it, I would have given it up a long time ago rather than like, I'm the learning guy and I have to write about this. You know, it's, it's just whatever interests me. Yeah, it comes natural. I mean, one yeah. thing that I noticed from you is like, I put you in this category of people who are high signal human beings. Like, <laughs> well, it's, it's a compliment. It, it, and what I mean by that, for those who are unaware, it's like, there's a bunch of noise on the internet. And mm. the high signal is the people who stand out amongst the noise. And I always feel like, you know, where, how do those people come to be? And how how can other people attempt to be more high signal? Mm. I don't know. I mean, I guess it also depends on your definition of what's noise and what's signal because everyone mm -hmm. has their own taste. I'm sure there's some people who'd be like, oh yeah, that's just fluff or that's just noise or whatever on, on my blog. Um, I think one thing that helps, and we were talking about this a little bit before the show, is that uh, I really, I actually don't like overly topical writing. And there's a real pers professional incentive to do that kind of writing. Like, this is the news. And then everyone's got to have their hot take on the news. Or, you know, um, especially when there's, especially things that are emotionally charged to, you know, people talking about current events and stuff. And I mean, occasionally, like, you know, I'll, I'll like have things that'll like permeate through. So like when the, there's a few references to the pandemic when that was happening in the, in, in my blog and this kind of stuff. But generally, that's not where I like to go. Like, I, I like to... Um, I like to, like, my, my feeling is that, you know, you have the entirety of human knowledge of things you could talk about. And there's this little tiny spotlight where everyone's attention is right now. And that's great if you want to, if your goal is to just like participate in that conversation. But I also feel like there's just this big dark area that's just neglected by people. So I, I, we were also talking about how like, I'll do book reviews of books that are like 40 years old on my website. And, you know, I read it, it's new to me. And almost for sure it's new to the person who's reading the blog. So it might as well be a new book. And if it's a good book, why not talk about it? And so I, I have kind of an anti-topical sort of focus. Occasionally I break that rule, but usually I try to focus on, you know, what interests me or what questions interest me. And very often that's not, you know, you can find a really good book that's 40 years old. You don't, it doesn't have to be the newest book. And, and so I think that sort of tendency to look outside of where that spotlight is, um, Maybe that maybe that contributes to the flavor that my blog imparts upon people. What what are the the things that you look for in the resources you consume? The research I consume. Um, hmm. Well, I usually start with some kind of question. So there's some topic of interest that I, I want to learn about. And I think if you don't know anything about a topic, it's usually good to f try to find like a an informative summary because it's hard to ask good questions about a topic you don't know that much about. So if I were to just be like, um, all right, well, I'll, I'll give an example of something, some, some that I've done before. So I wanted to n know the science of like motivation and, and re research that. And the problem is, is that it's kind of hard to know even what are good questions to ask there. And so a good thing to do would be like, you know, buy some books. So I, I got a couple textbooks that were covering motivation. And that gives you this kind of like, because they're going to hit the big theories, they're going to hit the like, this is the big ways people think about it. And that helps ground the discussion of like, what it is that you need to pay attention to. And sometimes you get into a topic, and you realize the things that they care about are not the things you care about, but it gives you sort of a reference point. And then I'm often just uh, following citations. So you read like a big book, and then you're like, Oh, this is important. Let's read that. And then you read that. And then there's link to something else and link to something else. And um, I think there's lots of different ways you can do it, but I feel Wait, like that I just kind wanna... of hub and spoke process works pretty well. Oh, yeah, sorry. I just want to, I want to stop you there. No, no, no. Because the, the clicking on the link yep. and the resource then requires you to say, is this right? Is this wrong? Where does this fit in my model of everything? And how do you go about doing that? Well, I think another uh, tip I have is, 
try not to form strong opinions when you're doing the research. I think it's good to be open-minded. I think the way I like to think about doing a research is like my job is to figure out what other people think about this. Mm. Um, not to necessarily form my own opinion yet, because I think it's very easy to be like, well, this is what's right. And then like, but then why are you doing research at all? Right. If, if that's your attitude, if it's your actual, like, I'm trying to confirm my own um, beliefs about things, I think you're going to have a bad time. And I think it's also going to be harder for you to, um, maybe appreciate why things are set up a certain way, because I, I'm talking a little bit more academic research here. I think it depends on the kind of research you're doing. Um, like if I were doing like how to start a business, it might be a little different uh, because it's less theoretical. It's a little bit more like, well, here's different approaches and stuff. But I think, uh, yeah, I think what I usually try to do is figure out, okay, like what are the ways that people who spend their lives thinking about this topic, what are the ways they think about it? And try to understand the ways they think about it and try to understand what are the arguments people have made put forward for different viewpoints. And um, I, I tend to be the kind of person who I tend to agree with the expert consensus where I find it. Like I feel, um, I feel sometimes people, I think fall, just be, like understanding and believing what experts think is a really underrated strategy to know more because you're rarely going to go wrong. Like if you read lots and lots of books, like that's what an expert is, is someone who's read more than you have about it. Right. And so if, if like 80% of experts think let's say proposition X about some idea uh, and you, you're like, you know, there's 15% to think why um, you know, you're going to be right more often than not. If you just like, if you read enough to understand what X is, then you just, okay, I, I'm going to agree with X because most of the people think X. Now I don't want to say that's like an ironclad rule. There's, there's exceptions to that. Um, but I think sometimes what people do is they like, they read one article for why <laughs> and they're like, I'm on team Y now. And it's sort of like, well, you haven't even read any of the stuff for X. So like, you don't even know why that like people don't like why or that, you know, this kind of thing. And I think I've fallen in that trap before. Like you read one book that really like really persuasively argues for a not standard viewpoint. And you're like, wow, this is true. Why doesn't everyone think this? And it's because you haven't read all the reasons why they think that doesn't work, you know? So um, I think just having a kind of like, what are the things people think about this? What are the ways they think about this? What are the different viewpoints? Why do people think those viewpoints are right or wrong? Like that's just a basic kind of foundational layer, I think, to to doing research um, uh, of the kind of like figuring out what people think. And it, it takes a long time too. So I don't think this is something that you can just like, okay, I'm just going to do it in an afternoon. Um, I think if you really want to know the answer to a topic, like there's kind of no shortcut to reading a lot of books about it. Um, if you're trying to find like a good summary, I, I usually try to find like, I like textbooks because even if the author of the textbook is a bit heterodox, like they're a bit like unconventional in their viewpoint, if they're writing a textbook for schools, they're going to have to at least explain why the standard opinion is the standard opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you read a popular book that was, um, you know, like, some science book, like popular science book, they can be like hundred percent one sided in like why they think this, you know, minority viewpoint is correct. Um, so I think textbooks are usually a good starting point. If you're only going to read one book, then like read a textbook or read, um, um, you know, some kind of empirical summary. Uh, if it's a niche question, literature reviews are good for that as well. Um, but if you want to like to really understand it, then you probably want to like read the textbook and then read the like, you know, seven or eight major ideas that people cite and, you know, maybe a few summaries of more recent research. And, and then you can kind of get a picture of like, well, I'm not an expert, but I kind of know, like I could kind of parrot why people think the way they do. Were you always like this? Like, did you always, <laughs> he, he spits that out his good follow up question. question. Were you always like this? Um, I don't, <laughs> I love that. I love that question. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just gotta get over that. Um, I, I think to some extent, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I always liked reading about things and always like learning things again, kind of like why, you know, you have to be kind of an unusual person to like have a blog that's like for 20 years. All you're talking about is how to learn stuff. But I think, um, I've, it's gotten exacerbated over time. I think mm -hmm. you figure out how to do some things and then that like that knowledge and those skills open up other things. So when I was a kid, I, w I didn't really have any interest in learning languages. And then I went to France and I kind of struggled a bit learning French, but I got there in the end. 
And then I did this, uh, after that, I did a project where I was learning multiple languages. And now the idea of learning languages just like, it just kind of seems obvious and appealing to me. And so similarly, like I've spent a lot of time because of its adjacency to learning and topics, reading a lot about psychology. But now I'm like, I kind of have a lot of background information. So if I want to learn another sort of subfield of psychology, it's a lot easier for me because I already know a lot of the ideas that would go into it. So I think there's a real truism that like the more you learn, the easier it is to learn new things because you have the background knowledge to like make sense of what you're reading and you don't have to be like, uh, and so there's topics that I don't know as much about that they're just, there's a bit more of a barrier for me to start learning them. I could learn them, of course, but there's a bit more of a barrier just because I would have to like build that foundation first. So like, I don't know a ton about music, for instance. And so if like, you know, someone was explaining to me, you know, whenever they're saying like, oh, it's this arpeggio with this kind of thing. Like I have, like I can read those words and have some, but I don't have like, I don't hear the music in my head or I don't hear like, Oh, I know what exactly what they're talking about. And so it would take some of that work. But if I built that foundation, then I could do that for that as well. So I think it's one of those things that like, if you're all already kind of a curious person, then if you add to that a lot of knowledge and skills, it just, you know, it hypertrophies, you just become like even more obsessive and <laughs> interested in stuff. So, so yes, I have always been like this, but I'm even more so now. That would be my short answer. And what was the first time that you were rewarded for your ability to learn? Well, I mean, I was always kind of a clever kid in school. And so I feel like I, I had that going for me, like early on, you know, you get the praise from people that like, oh, you know, you did this fairly well. So I don't have the rags to riches story here of like, I was a really bad student and now I've figured it out, which uh, would be great for selling books. That's, don't get me wrong. I like, whenever I see people who have like, they're advertising that position that they were like, I was an F student and now I'm A plus and PhD at Harvard. And I was like, yeah, that would be a good background story to have. But for me, I always, I, I always did well in school, but I think, um, I think the thing that kind of was a real shift was after graduation, I became kind of more interested in, uh, like th this, that what I talk about in ultra learning, this sort of self-directed learning projects. And so it's hard to find like a reward for that particularly, but, you know, definitely doing that MIT challenge, which we can talk about a little bit. I know I did mention what that was, but doing that project and having the kind of like getting some recognition for it after and this sort of thing. Um, I mean, it's the reason I'm doing this now. It's the reason I'm talking to you. It's the reason I wrote a book. So that was a huge moment. But I mean, early childhood, I'm sure there was a lot of like reinforcement around like, you know, uh, oh, you know, you're doing good at this or you should keep doing this and that kind of thing. So, yeah. So I guess now might be a good time to insert what yeah. the MIT <laughs> challenge actually yeah. is. Little parentheses right here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, would you like to explain sure, it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You so, lived it better yeah, than, yeah, yeah. Better sure. than me. So this was now over 10 years ago. So just keep that in mind. But after I graduated from university, I, um, I wanted to study computer science, MIT. They have a platform called Open Courseware where they publish a lot of their course materials for free. And I was thinking, you know, has anyone ever tried to like, try to replicate what you would learn in an MIT uh, computer science degree, but just using their free material? And I couldn't find anyone who'd done it before. And that seemed kind of crazy to me that like no one had ever tried this before. So I, I made this project called the MIT challenge where I was going to try to pass MIT's exams, just the exams. That was the original plan to just pass the final exams for um, what would be in the classes for uh, a four-year MIT student. Now there was some deviations to that just because certain classes weren't available and I had to substitute them, but the approximate course load was there, approximate curricular breadth was there. And, uh, and I also added at the end, the programming projects, because there was only about maybe like eight classes that had uh, programming projects. And so I figured if I'm going to learn computer science, I should do the programming projects as well. And so that was the MIT challenge. And so this was a project that I started. And when I told people that I was going to do this, they were like, that's super weird. Why are you doing that <laughs> initially? But then after it was done, um, it got a lot of attention. Like I was, you know, from page of Reddit and I got, you know, people 
asking me to join their startup and job offers and whatnot. And that was really like the start of a journey for me in like venturing into, oh, you know, if you just want to learn X, you can do it. Like you can just do it. Like there's no, oh, I have to go to this elite school and pay millions of dollars or I don't have to, you know, have, like you can just do it. The, the materials are out there. Now I will say, you know, doing the project, has its own challenges. So I don't want to say that like that particular project is something that everyone could do, but I think it is something that if you just generalize it a little bit and just have the general idea of like, I want to learn skill X, how could I do it? Like, that's what my life has been about is uh, figuring out that process. How long did it take? Well, I did it over a year. So it was 12 months, 12 months. You did a normal four year degree. Well, again, a four-year degree, it was the curriculum that would be taught in a four-year degree. But I mean, I wasn't doing the public speaking projects. I wasn't. So there, there's deviations that also made it easier than doing a four-year degree, which is an important thing to point out. Because like, if you're in a normal class and you've got like some group project that takes three months, like, no, I wasn't doing that. So of course it was easier. Um, but in terms of like, you're taking the final exam and this is the material they covered and you have to answer the final exam questions correctly, then yeah, that was, that was roughly what I was doing. So um, you know, I, there's nitpicks here, but broadly speaking, yes. I appreciate you pointing out the the, the subtle ways and the nitpicks. You know, this points to something that I've really started to understand and think about recently. My video editor for this podcast, shout yeah. out Video King Pablo. He, <laughs> he basically sent me one clip a day of this podcast and he made a job for himself. Yeah. And the reason why I bring this up is like he basically learned video editing because he desired to learn video editing and he made a a job for himself out of nowhere, which kind of increased my level of belief and in the idea that, oh, you can do anything you just set your mind to and you believe you can do. Um, not anything, obviously, well, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but just the general point of like, if you want it, it will, it will manifest if it's in alignment with the thing that makes sense for you to do. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I think the the attitude I have about it is just again, it's it's kind of hard to describe from you know, we're talking about simulating reality and this kind of thing, but it's the experience I had sort of before and after was after I really had this strong sense of, oh, you know, you could design a project to learn pretty much any skill and be successful at it if you were to go about it the right way. Um that sounds very abstract, but I mean, like there's a lot of, I think, sense of like, oh, maybe I wouldn't be able to learn that or maybe I wouldn't be able to figure that out. And I think there's just, there's so much material online. There's so many resources that if you were, it had the initiative to pull them together and go about it the right way, you probably could. And um, I think that's just sort of been a fundamental belief of mine <laughs> from from that project going forward that, you know, oh, well, if you wanted to like, if you wanted to know anything, you could figure it out and, and learn it. And um, and I mean, that's that's different, I think, maybe from the more scholastic attitude that you might have where you're just like taking classes and there's no there's no real like I have to design the project myself and figure out how I'm going to learn it. Like That's often absent in um, formal schooling. And so I think it can often lead to a sense where, you know, it just feels really alien to try to tackle something like that yourself. Well, it also points to the idea that it's like the world that's given to you, like yeah. other people's perspectives of what you should learn versus your own and designing your own education for life. And yeah. I feel like you've very much done that. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, now don't get me wrong, I, I think that it's great, like often what you're doing when you're having to design your own project is figuring out, well, what do people who actually know this skill think is the thing way to learn it, right? Like if I wanted to become, well, using your example of video editor, that would be one thing I would look at is like, well, what do video editors actually think is the right way to learn, do video editing? Or if I wanted to learn music or piano or something, um, like I'm not going to just like, oh, I have this like new theory of like how to learn it. I'm going to be like, well, what is the way that like concert pianists get really good at it, right? Um, so there is always a borrowing from other people of, of this, um, attitude. But I think part of what it is, is that, um, you know, when you're going and you're learning a skill, you're often restricted in terms of, um, like to use the language learning for example, you, you have a, like, there's this class, that's it. And so you go to the class and they're telling you to learn these words and this kind of thing. But 
they don't know that, well, I'm actually going on a trip next week. So maybe I want to do learn some different things. And similarly, like, you know, programming, computer science, uh, if you knew, okay, well, I, I know I need to go in this direction, or I want to go in this direction. So what do I need to do that? So I think the kind of choose your own adventure aspect of the ultra learning process is, is a big part of it. Because instead of taking the perspective of like, well, this is my, like, I want to learn a language. Okay, I just download Duolingo and I'm just going to stick to their Duolingo script. You kind of like step back a bit and say, well, there's lots of different things for learning languages. Like, which ones should I choose? How do I evaluate them? How do I, you know, sequence them? Like, what are, you know, that's a, it's kind of a meta problem instead of just like, how do I proceed through this curriculum that, you know, maybe good, maybe it's not good. Maybe it's, you know, what's available. It's like, how do I step back and like evaluate what ones should I choose and how should I go through it? And what are the pros and cons and that kind of thing? And sometimes you end up in weird places. Like, as I said, you know, doing this MIT challenge project was like a very unusual things, but it happened to fit the constraints of what I wanted to do. How do you know if it's, if you're spending too much time on the meta learning part of it? Of the meta of it. Oh, like I'm just going to plan and I'm going to rearrange. Have you ever fell into that trap? I mean, I think people, so here, here's a kind of a beef of mine. Like you, when you hear, especially like in entrepreneurial circles, there's a real like take action and like, don't, don't do this planning. That's a waste of time kind of thing. And I understand the impulse because you know, taking action can often be scary. Doing the thing can often be effortful and work. And so there is maybe, maybe there's a tendency to procrastinate or to not do it. But very rarely do I see someone who's like really planning strategically and intensively and then not doing the work. It's usually just like you're daydreaming. You're not actually doing anything, right? So I think the, there is some cases where you need to start doing it in order to get information about how it works in order to actually plan. So there's definitely situations where you want to do, um, you maybe want to do a little bit of it just so you know what, like to get some groundings to know what you're talking about. But I mean, I very rarely met someone who is like, let's say you want to learn Mandarin Chinese, right? And you're spending like three hours a day. You're reading every blog, you know, every single resource, you know, the right way to learn it. You know, the like, like I very met very few people who are doing that. And then not also learning Chinese. Usually it's just someone who's like, well, I think I'd like to do this sometime. And then they're like daydreaming about it. So for me, I feel like the, like the distinction is not between like the meta planning and the actual learning. It's kind of like between doing it and not doing it. And Mm -hmm. so I think, uh, you know, you can, there are maybe some circumstances where I can imagine someone getting like too into the weeds of the like theory and not actually going out and doing it. Maybe if the skill is like particularly scary, uh, or, you know, it requires some kind of intrinsic difficulty that's hard, but I feel like, you know, just being obsessed with like learning it and and the right way to learn it. Usually those two things go together. Like the person who spends a lot of time figuring out like what's the right way to like practice tennis is usually also practicing tennis. It's not usually the case that like they just have like tons and tons of books on tennis, but they've like never played a game, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a person who's like that and they need to actually weigh out that thing, but I just don't encounter them that often. That's interesting because I just talked to someone who, who was telling me how he, he had a, he has a podcast out now. Okay. But that he was planning the podcast for a year. And for, for a really me, long I was, time. And mm, I was like, that's a really yeah. long time. Like, yeah, what's yeah. going on there? Like, <laughs> well, maybe why this did... person does need to make the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they have. And they have 21 mm-hmm. episodes in the backlog right now because they wanted, to, they wanted to get past episode 20 where most people quit. But yeah, I was like, I, I feel like you just jump into yeah. it. Yeah, I do think so. I don't know. I've been, I'm more of a jumper, maybe. Maybe that's why I'm, I'm giving this advice. Uh, like I, when I would say about like writing, for instance, my writing advice is usually like write a hundred essays and then figure out like what you want to do with writing. Because a lot of the writing thing is that writing is adjacent to speaking. It's not the same as speaking, but it's adjacent to speaking. And so it's not like, uh, programming or I don't know, physics or something like that, where it's like, if you don't know how to do it, you really don't know how to do it at all. It is something where the, you know, just producing writing fluently is its own challenge. Um, so I can definitely see some circumstances where that would be the case, but I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to impart is that a lot of times what I see is not so much, like really rigorous planning or the kind of activity I'd call planning, but just daydreaming. 
It's just someone thinking about doing a podcast for a year. Like they're not like, okay, these are going to be my guests. This is how I'm going to schedule. This is going to be my format. I've reviewed the audio equipment. This is the audio equipment I'm getting. And like, this is the right way to do it. And this is how I'm going to grow my traffic. And like, cause that's also work. And I just feel like, you know, the daydreaming mindset is just apart from that. Right. Uh, but I think there may be some kinds of content, like, you know, maybe you're watching videos online where they're talking about something and it's just, it's a really low effort investment. Maybe that's the thing. Maybe that's it. It's just a low effort investments versus high effort investments. So, cause to me, planning and meta planning is like very high intensity. And so it tends to go along with actually doing it. Whereas there's like, there's also forms of doing it, which are really low intensity, which don't work really well. Like, I don't know. My, I, I've always like to like crap on Duolingo. That's like my favorite hobby horse to get on of like, I don't like Duolingo for language learning, but it's also partly because it's so easy, right? So if you're like, Oh, I want to learn French. Ah, Duolingo. Okay, great. Now I can spend eight seconds a day, you know, learning a few verbs and like mix and matching things, doing this word search. Um, and it's just to me, like, uh, yeah, there is, you're doing it. You're actually, you're not like doing meta learning. You're not like you're, you're doing some kind of structured program, but it's just, it just happens to be one that's like really low effort and you know, sometimes not totally aligned with what your actual goals are. And so I think that can be true of any domain of learning that like there's the easy things and the hard things. And then, you know, the tendency is to do the easy things and not the hard things. And so in cases where planning happens to be the easy thing, then I could, I could imagine that happening. Yeah. What have you learned from 15 plus years of writing on the internet? <laughs> that I'm old. No, um, 15 years is a long time on the internet. Like it's not a long time in a lot of other professions. Like if I were an academic, oh, I've been active for 15 years is like nothing. Like all the famous academics are like, you know, they're like 92 right now or something. Like, oh yeah, I published that book back, you know, before I was born. But online, it really is just a lifetime. Like, you know, we're doing this on a podcast. We're recording video. Like, I started doing this before Skype was like a big thing, you know? Like, when there was just the, you know, 180p super grainy, like, this whole thing that we're doing was impossible. Um, I, I, when I started the big thing to do to get traffic to your blog was something called a blog carnival. Even me using the word blog sounds dated right now. So I'm just like, I'm a literal dinosaur there. Like I'm starting like from that very early period. Now there are some advantages to that. It was a period of time where it was extremely easy to get like Google traffic with like mediocre writing. Now I can't get Google traffic and my essays are much better than they were before. Um, like I now have to compete with like the New York Times columnists and like, you know, eminent professionals who, you know, are writing online and stuff. And so I think there is, there's so many changes that have happened that it's, uh, you know, it's almost kind of a marvel that I'm still doing this because of how much has shifted. And I think that it's going to continue to do that. I mean, maybe we're stabilizing, maybe like, you know, we're out of the infancy and now we're like stabilizing where you have, you know, dominant social media platforms and you have, you know, some dominant media outlets like the New York Times and stuff. And maybe you have, um, I don't know what it is, but you know, I, I, maybe we haven't finished the end of innovation. Like TikTok kind of caught me by surprise. I was really like this, this is the thing that we're now doing. But again, that's because I'm old. And so the kids can, you know, they can get off my lawn. Right. <laughs> Mark Manson had a really interesting point about this where he, yeah. he, he said that right now he believes video is in the same place that text based media was, I believe five to 10 years ago or 10 to 15 years ago, which I found to be interesting and like you think it's going to be bigger like what's the he thinks video right now is in the same place mm. that i guess blogs or text based was five to 15 yeah. years ago which i find fascinating i mean maybe i do think like again video just the technology is caught up that uh you know bandwidth and infinite storage space and this kind of thing that like now it's a lot easier to produce uh, video. And it could be the case that like, yeah, you know, we're joking about TikTok, but like 10 years from now, it's going to be like this super professional core of like pro video people who, you know, are also, you know, experts in this kind of thing. And, and then there's like these really slick, like, you know, 15 second things. And everyone's gonna be like, remember when it was TikTokers and they were just like people with their phone and stuff. So maybe that's going to happen. I'm really bad at forecasting trends for things. So mm. I just, I just hang on. I just like try to hang on. But I mean, I think it goes back to what we were talking about, about topicality and, and this kind of thing that um, I think there's definitely groups of 
writers and bloggers that they're just um, they're very savvy with like the media, and they're like, ah, I'm gonna you know mine this platform, and this is how to make content on this platform, and maybe that's why I'm not as more successful than I could be, but. My my sort of approach has always just been like, yeah, write what I like to read and put the content out there. And uh, I mean, it's worked for me. It's, it gives me a living. So I, I, I don't know what's going to happen exactly, but I think, you know, that's going to be my goal probably. You know, this is what we're talking about is loosely related to the idea of learning because as what is going to be true without a shadow of a doubt is that you are going to have to learn how the world changes in some way. And I am so fascinated about this idea. Is like, you know one thing's for sure. The world will be different 10 years from now than it is today. And, and in ways that we possibly can't understand. So what are you going to do about it? I mean, I think that it's always true. I think there's, there's two parts to that. Because on the one part, sometimes there's this like, the world's changing. So kind of learning stable bodies of knowledge, sort of fundamental skills. Like there's no point in that because it's always going to be changing, right? And I think that's fundamentally not true. Like as I was saying about reading books that are 40 years old. Actually, if you want to understand, like if we're talking about science or something like that, almost everything is really old. Like you almost have to learn nothing that's new. Like if you just like if you just take someone who doesn't know anything and you're going to talk about like biology or physics or even okay, even computer science, like this machine learning, which is like super hyped right now. Like basically all these theories were developed in like the 80s, right? Like I have a book, um, parallel, parallel distributed processing, where they talk about like the deep learning delta rule, like this kind of back propagation and stuff. So there is always going to be new stuff. There's always going to be new stuff, but if you are just like coming out it from the outside and you're not at the frontier of knowledge, you're not yet like already an expert and you know everything already, then that big mass that you need to get to the frontier of knowledge is almost always old. So in that sense, I think a lot of learning is timeless. It doesn't change and knowing more is better. But what you said is absolutely right. There's always going to be changes in the technology, in the business environment, in uh Basically, I think just the idea is that not even so much that there's so much new stuff that you have to learn because it's changing, but just that the demands to know more are going up, that like everything is becoming more knowledge intensive because all the simpler jobs got automated away. And soon, you know, we've got like large language models. I wouldn't be surprised if they're going to start eating away at some of the lower end of a lot of other jobs. We already see with programming that, you know, you can get like a lot of like simple, you know, boilerplate programming stuff. You can just tell ChatGPT to do it and it will do it for you. And so that, what does that mean as a programmer? Does that mean that you don't need to learn programming? No, not at all. Like, of course you need to know programming and you need to learn the same things. But you also probably need to be someone who has a much deeper reservoir of programming knowledge to still be useful in the future. So in some ways, I think what's going to happen is the demands for learning are, are going to accelerate just because, you know, I, I talk about it, this in ultra learning, there's, you know, the uh, new technology, there's like outsourcing, the kind of winner takes all sort of uh, spread of knowledge. And all of these forces are conspiring to, you know, basically make it so that you have to have a, a stronger reservoir of knowledge to really succeed, at least at the top levels. I mean, there's always going to be people who, you know, they have a niche and they, they do what they do. But I think that uh, just the demands are going up. And I even see this in what I'm doing. Like, because as I said, you know, when I started blogging, it was very informal. No one was an expert. No one was doing things. So you could just really be like me, just a kid, just sharing your opinion. And that was good enough. And now I have to compete with like, you know, world eminent scientists who are writing about the same topics. And it's sort of like, well, why would you read me if you can read, you know, Daniel Kahneman who won a Nobel prize, or you can read someone else. Right. So I have to up my game. I have to read all those things. I have to read this research. I have to be much smarter than I was 10, 15 years ago. And I think that's only going to continue. And so it's not so much about everything being new. It's about, I think just, um, the demands to be someone who knows a lot of things that has sort of uh, these skills and stuff, I think is just going to go up. And so that just necessarily means that you're going to have to lead a lot of self-education efforts because once you graduate from school, there's going to be a lot less of that. Like, well, I'm going to go back and do four years for this. You're going to be like, I have to get brushed up on this topic because it's, it's relevant to my work. Where do I start? You know? So I think that's, what's going to happen. Where do I start today? And yeah, how do I yeah. learn this in, in the next month, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so what do most people get wrong when they're thinking about learning? 
other than mm, not of, planning. Lots of things. <laughs> yeah. Lots of things. I think we have a lot of um, misconceptions about how learning works. Um, and so, you know, these are even misconceptions that maybe I had uh, before. So I think they're just kind of like folk theories of psychology. And then you like read a lot of cognitive science and you, and you learn things. So like one of them is uh, I think we have a I, I to call it like a mind muscle analogy that we sort of think about like, well, our mind is this muscle. And so we just strengthen it with things and it'll make us smarter. So, you know, that's the kind of the rationale that is often given out for like doing Sudoku puzzles or playing chess or these kind of things. And that's not how the mind works at all. Like the way that we work is we learn patterns of information. And then those patterns allow us to perform with the skills. I'm being a little vague here. There's lots of different theories that kind of specify that in detail. But one of the consequences of that is that uh, when you learn a skill, it tends to be a bit more narrow than people think it is. And so if you are, um, if, yeah, if you're learning uh, mathematics, then that mostly helps you with learning that mathematics and the things that that mathematics applies toward. Um, if you are like learning a language, it helps you with learning that language. It doesn't just generally make your memory stronger. And so what this means is that basically the, the what of what you're learning is super important. That's, that's basically <laughs> very important for the learning part. I mean, there's maybe a little bit of on the top learning how to learn skills. And that's obviously what I devote my career towards. So, you know, there's effective ways to study, not effective ways to study. There's, you know, these sorts of understandings. But when we're talking about actually doing the learning, it's very important that you're learning kind of the right things. And so I think that's, uh, that's something that, you know, if you have a kind of, well, it doesn't really matter what you're learning, it's all mentally strengthening, then you're missing that. So that's a common viewpoint that I think is wrong. Um, another thing I think that people get wrong is the value of uh, retrieval practice. So this is another thing that I talk about in the book, that um, if you give people tests and you ask them, uh, like, what do you think is going to be a more effective way to study? They tend to gravitate towards this sort of repeated review, which is like looking over the material again and again. But actually doing the test with the material closed and trying to recall tends to be a more effective approach for internalizing it. And you can see this in little ways. Like um, if you've ever had to give a memorized speech before, I don't know whether this is a common thing, but if you've ever had to give a memorized speech before, everyone uses cue cards. And what they do is they just read their cue cards over and over and over again. And that's a kind of a slow way to memorize it. Better way to memorize it, close the cue cards, try to recite your speech, and then look at the cue cards when you get stuck. And that internalizes it a lot faster because of retrieval practice. Um, I mean, there's other things that we could talk about too, but I think there's a lot of misconceptions people have about how learning works. And it also encourages them to approach studying in ineffective ways. So as we said about the retrieval practice, I think that's definitely an area where people get misled because uh, it feels harder. It feels like you're doing it worse, but it's actually more effective. Yeah. And, and on the speaking piece, it's like, it makes you more relaxed going to like, I, how, how much is relaxation in your, in the learning process important to understanding and comprehending things? Well, so I think it's not so much relaxation per se, but I think the way right to think about it is that when you're learning, you have a certain mental bandwidth. So this is in, in technical terms called working memory. And so imagine this is your mental bandwidth. Now, you want basically that entire mental bandwidth to be filled with the thing you're trying to learn. Now, if you're stressed or worried, then you're having these intrusive worrying thoughts. Now, those take up some of the bandwidth. So half of the bandwidth is now you thinking about something that you're stressed about and the other half is devoted to learning. So you're going to learn less as a result. And so this is a bigger deal with... Um, subjects where having that full bandwidth is super important. So math is an example of like, where because there's lots of little details and stuff that you have to integrate in order to understand what you're doing. And this is why math anxiety can be so difficult because if you're like having a lot of anxious thoughts and worries that are eating up this cognitive bandwidth while doing it, then it's, it's going to hurt you. And uh, so this also relates because of this uh, this working memory bottleneck. It tends to mean that being in a, fairly relaxed state where you're not, where basically your whole attention is absorbed in the task. Kind of that kind of state is usually better um, than one where you are, uh, you know, worried about things or your mind is elsewhere. But I think there can also be a sort of one of the problems again, and this is why it's sort of a complicated issue is that uh, being too relaxed can also not be good because the idea here is that, 
often when you're relaxed, when you're kind of not investing a lot of effort, you're doing what comes most naturally, most fluently, most effortlessly. And there are certain kinds of learning where that's not a problem. You're just, you're just learning. You're just learning. It's fine. But there's other times where what you're learning is you're trying to inhibit a response that seems intuitive. So, um, you know, if I was trying to work on my pronunciation in another language, for instance, there is going to be, because of my native language, a way that I produce the sounds that is most natural. But maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I want to do it the other way. And that requires deliberate effort and attention. And so in some ways, it's going to be like a more intense experience if you're practicing it that way than if you're just like, ah, whatever, I'm just going to say it, whatever comes out. So this whole idea about like fluency and ease is a kind of a complicated one because you definitely don't want to be anxious. You don't want to be worried. You don't have intrusive thoughts that are unrelated to learning. But there's often this kind of trade-off where uh, you want to build fluency, but you also want to avoid kind of calcifying bad habits and the resisting the pull of bad habits is itself effortful. So I think it, it does depend on what you're learning. And so you will see in some corners of the internet where people will say like, well, it's all about flow and being in a flow state. Mihai Chiksa Mihai, if, if someone wants to Google it, flow state, this sort of, you're not even thinking, you're totally absorbed in the task. That's the key to learning. And then other people are like, it's all about deliberate practice. Anders Ericsson, if you want to Google that too, deliberate practice where it's very focused and effortful and draining and hard. And I think um, both are important. And it's, I think, just depends on what is the cognitive activity in learning. And so uh, the deliberate practice, I think, is more important when what you're trying to do is like counteract the fluent response. And I think the sort of fluency is maybe more important when um, you're either just like acquiring knowledge, but it's not causing that effortful problem, or you're just trying to build fluency. So you're just trying to make what you're doing more automatic and you're kind of doing it the right way. So it does depend, but I think that would be my overall explanation of how it impacts it. And when you talk about the total mental bandwidth, I assume yeah. that this varies person by person. How much yeah. does it vary? Uh, so I don't, that's a hard question because there's two parts to that. So on the one hand, the, this working memory capacity, there's this really famous paper by George Miller where it's called the magic number seven plus or minus two. This is like seminal psychology paper. And he talks about how all these different experiments all pinpoint that there's this number of like five to nine, which is supposedly the memory capacity of your head. Now there's some recent analyses that like, maybe he was like, it's actually less than that. It's probably closer to four. Wow. But the, the basic idea is that this is like the amount of like singular pieces of information maybe we can put in our head at the same time. Now it's true that some people have different working memory capacities. They do these kind of what they're called end back uh, tests where it's like they give you a string of numbers you have to remember. And then they'll say like, what was the number three numbers ago? And that you don't know when they're going to interrupt you. So basically you have to keep a, like a loop of the last X numbers. And that means that because you're hearing numbers one at a time, and you have to keep them in your head. It's very mentally demanding. So they use this to measure working memory capacity. And so as a raw capacity, some people have more, some people have less, and it does probably impact learning. But the complication of that is that as you learn more about things, they take up less space. So hmm. one of the mechanisms, this was in George Miller's original paper is chunking, which is the idea that like a pattern, which is, you know, multiple elements, you fuse it into one element and then you can recall it. And so the, my favorite one is when you're doing with acronyms. Now I can't do it off my uh, head right now, but the idea basically is that if you take like FBI, CIA, MBA, and then you like scramble the letters and you just present them to people, they'll be very hard, hard time remembering those nine letters. But if you just gave them FBI, CIA, MBA, they remember all three because it's only three chunks and not nine. And so that's a key way that we learn. And it's one way that having prior knowledge allows us to acquire new knowledge because you have those chunks. So when you're reading like a physics paper, it just looks like a bewildering mess. But if you're a physicist, because you've chunked almost everything that's in the paper, you can quickly focus in on like the two or three things that you don't understand. And it's really easy to follow. And it's not because you have more working memory capacity. It's because you have more long-term memory. You have more knowledge in your head. So that's one way. The second way is that, um, and this is Anders Ericsson, again, had this whole theory of that with skills, people actually develop, um, we don't, we're not aware of this, this is happening unconsciously, but it, there's an unconscious mechanism to create these retrieval cues so that you can kind of temporarily offload things that you're working on for complex problems 
into your memory. But the catch for this as well is that you have to have skill. Like you have to have lots of practice to be able to do this. So it's one of those things where, um, yes, some people have more working memory capacity than others. And for like all else being equal, they're going to not only learn faster, but they're going to be less distracted. They're going to have an easier time with confusing materials. Um, there's some theories that working memory is like what we think of as someone being smart is they have a slightly larger working memory capacity. But I think the important caveat to add to that is that yes, that's true in the all else being equal world. But if you know more or you have more experience, then you're going to outperform a really clever person who doesn't have that. And one of my favorite um, studies that shows this was there was a study of um, uh, the, the really famous one was with baseball, but I think there was one where they actually looked at working memory capacity was with soccer. But basically they took kids who were uh, like knew a lot about baseball and didn't know a lot about baseball and also ones that were like good readers and poor readers, which is what kind of a proxy for like smarter kids and less smart kids. And what they found was that if you read, if they read a passage about a baseball game and then were asked to recall facts, what mattered was not how good a reader you were, but how much you knew about baseball. So if you were like a poor reader, but you knew a lot about baseball, you would remember everything in the passage. Whereas if you were a really generically smart kid, but you didn't know a lot about baseball, you read the passage, you don't remember anything. And so I think because because smarter people tend to also know more, we see this correlation. We see this like intelligence and knowledge being the same thing, but they're probably separable in that if you just happen to know a lot about a subject, you're kind of effectively smarter at it. And so this is why it's helpful to know lots of things. This is why it's helpful to learn lots of stuff. This is why, you know, this lifelong learning of like, if you just spend decades continually studying things, you are going to be a smarter person in that way. Now, it, it, the mind muscle analogy, it's not in a generic kind of like, I can do anything capacity. But there is a sense in which, you know, if you know a lot about baseball, someone's talking about baseball, you know what they're talking about. If someone's talking about biology, and you've never heard of the theory of evolution before, you're gonna have a hard time understanding what they're talking about. And that's not only just for comprehension, but for learning skills and, and everything as well. So that's, that's how I would I would frame it. What came to mind for me was taking the ACT and they would have these reading passages and you'd have yeah. to summarize them. It's like, wow. So I guess the kids who did the best on the different passages, what they were actually testing on was not necessarily their reading comprehension, but how much the passages related to the things that the people knew. Yeah. Went, and yeah. which is, which is really well, crazy to think about. Like, how do you, how could you possibly standardize that? Well, here's the thing. So, um, uh, the educational theorist, uh, E.D. Hirsch, uh, he just, I just finished reading his book. So this is why it's top of mind, but he, um, uh, this book is called why knowledge matters. Um, uh, but he, he talks about how there's been, uh, now he, he used to be a, I think he's also an educational psychologist, but he was also like a literary scholar. So his background is sort of like reading and, and this kind of thing. And he found that like, there has been a, trend in educational practice in the United States. And also he talks about there was kind of like a naturalized experiment in France where there's change occurred, where instead of sort of teaching a coherent curriculum where you teach people lots of subjects, there was a lot of emphasis on reading comprehension skills. So like finding the main idea or close reading or doing these kinds of skills with the idea that if you got good at finding the main idea, even if it was a passage you knew nothing about, you'd get better at it. And what they find when they do research is that like probably after several hours of practice doing this, there's like no further returns. Like there's maybe a little bit of like, well, there's a main idea here. I have to do it. But most of them finding the main idea skill is just actually understanding the passage and understanding the passage is mostly dependent on knowing what the passage talks about and having background knowledge. And so he makes the the case that like what we really need to be doing is giving kids background knowledge and not teaching them reading comprehension skills because those skills don't exist. And I think that there's some, probably some truth to that. And that's related also to this kind of mind is a muscle analogy here that like a lot of what we think of as being some kind of generic skill is just knowing a lot of stuff. So, you know, um, this famous uh, chess experiment uh, by Adrian de Groot, he was this Dutch uh, psychologist. He was studying uh, chess players. And one of the findings was that, you know, if you give chess players uh, a, a board position, 
experienced chess players are able to recall it from memory very easily and novices are not. So if, if you don't know chess very well and I show you just a random chess position and then I take it away and I say, okay, reassemble it. Most people are going to put like three or four pieces down and they're going to get a bunch wrong. Whereas the chess masters, they could see a piece and they could remember it. And this, this goes to the extent where like there's some blindfolded chess players, but they'll play chess blindfolded and they can do like 10 boards at the same time. They can just walk around and like, they have a working, like they have a memory of like nine different chess games going on. But the reason why is because they have so many patterns of chess moves that they only need like the CIA, FBI. They only need like one or two words to describe what the entire chess position is. Oh, it's uh, you know, Berlin defense where they've done the fillet or what. I don't actually know chess positions. So I'm making stuff up here, but like it's this and this and this and oh, they're cut. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is this situation. Oh, and I remember this piece was under threat and this kind of thing. Whereas the novice is just like, Oh, look at all these pieces and where they all go. And, and so there is a, a, an intuition, I think, a mistaken intuition that people have is that they look at the elite chess player and they think this is someone who just is like extremely smart. And this is what you see when you like see like, I don't know, Queen's Gambit or these are just like some real brilliant person and they're just able to do things with their mind that normal people can't. Uh, when it's probably more likely that they're like kind of a bookish person that is just has way more knowledge about chess than you would expect someone to have. But it also suggests a remedy that if you wanted to be smarter about X – like knowing way more about it than most people is the way that actually most experts are smarter than other people is by doing that. And there's, there's common everyday situations you can analogize to that. Like if you think about reading, if you're an average educated adult, you can read relatively fluently. But if you think about what you're actually doing with your mind to accomplish this, it's, it's like, it's mind boggling, right? You have to like look at these squiggles, identify what each of these squiggles are, assemble them into words, pronounce them in your head, fabricate them into a sentence, figure out what the meaning is. But we do this without even like knowing how we do it. And, and so that is the lesson of practice and learning is that if you have the background, then you're able to do it. Well, this is so fascinating. This idea that I love reading. I know mm -hmm. it seems like you love reading as well. There's a lot of people who love reading, but as a general population, the, the amount of people who love reading versus the amount of people who love listening to reading yeah. or watching things yeah. is so much smaller. Yeah. Which in some sense to me, like to my like 13 year old self is like kind of sad. But in another <laughs> sense, it's amazing now that anybody has access to listen to all yeah. of the information for the first time ever in human history. It's pretty yeah. remarkable. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not a reading chauvinist either. Like I don't have this kind of like, well, reading is good and you shouldn't be listening to those podcasts or videos. I mean, whatever it is that you want to do to get the information. But I do think that's probably the case that if you are like not, you don't read frequently, reading is going to be more effortful than listening because listening is kind of, it's a skill that our brains were evolved to do, uh, spoken communication. Written communication is an alien ability that we learn effortly, effort, uh, effortfully. It's not something that, um, no one is born like just automatically they're going to be able to read, right? There was millennia that it was only like an elite scholarly class that knew how to read. Everyone was illiterate. So this is just very much like mathematics, like many other things. It is something that you have to acquire. And because of that, it takes a lot of practice for you to get it down to that effortless range. Um, and the other thing too, is that a lot of um, written communication is in a different register. So the, the density is often higher than a conversation. I mean, I'm, we're having a conversation right now, but if you read the transcript, it would be like, someone needs to edit this, right? Because there'd just be so many like little filler things and this kind of stuff. But that also, that, that density also means that like what we're talking about, the mental bandwidth is higher. You can construct written sentences that would be very difficult to uh, spontaneously utter like you to read it would require like because it has like multiple clauses and this kind of thing so there is some sense that you know even just with the language itself it's often more difficult uh reading and so i think that um for a lot of people they just reading is a little bit more effortful than listening and so when they're evaluating their pastimes they choose to listen um over reading now i mean i read enough that i actually like prefer reading to listening uh but there's definitely things you can't do when you're like you can't wash the dishes and read. It's hard to do that. So I, I do listen when I'm in those circumstances. But I understand why a lot of people are like, no, nah, I'm not a reader because, you know, it's just it's just easier for them. It doesn't require as much effort for them to listen to a conversation than it is to, to read it. It also goes back to our point about being high signal. A lot of the people <laughs> that I consider high signal are writers. And there's something about writers. And 
just to give people a sense for who I am imagining in my head, it's people like you, Cal Newport, Morgan Housel, James Clear, right? These are like high signal thinkers. Like if you, if you stumble across one of your, one of your newsletters, you're like, all right, this is going to be something that's thoughtful <laughs> and interesting. Oh, thank you. And, and if, I think there's more effort that's required to write and to read. Yeah. When you read something that's edited, it, there's more there. Well, writing is not a natural ability either. We were just talking about, you know, um, I read a really interesting book by Carl Brader and uh, Marlene uh, Scardamalia, which I'm hoping I'm saying her name right, but called The Psychology of Written Composition. And uh, they have a whole theory of like how people write. But one of the interesting kind of like empirical findings is that uh, younger children, so we're talking about like grade school age children who know how to write, but they're not adults yet. Um, they write very easily and effortlessly. Like they, they don't have any difficulty writing, but many adults struggle with writing. And many of the greatest writers in the world are like have constant writer's block. And like, it's just, it's a cliche, you know, like, oh, I've got this book deadline and what am I going to do? And like, you know, they made movies about it. Right. And so they're part of the puzzle was like, that's the opposite of almost any other skill, almost any other skill. Beginners suck. It's effortful. It's really hard. You're sweating it. And the experts just do it without even thinking. Like we were just talking about reading is like that. Like, you know, if you don't know how to read, it's extremely difficult. If you know how to read, it's effortless. Um, and so why is it that way with writing? And they, they make the argument that actually they're, they're doing two completely different psychological processes that the kids are doing what they call a knowledge telling strategy, which is basically, What's the genre of what I'm writing? So is it an essay? Is it a story? Is it like a personal opinion? So they have some template for how that works. And then it's just say things as they come to mind. So you're just like one at a time rattling things off. Now, this does not produce great prose. This does not produce something that you want to read, which is if you've ever read, you know, third graders writing, it's not good. Like, sorry, third graders, but it's not good. <laughs> like, it's just like, who is this for? Whereas Shout out all the third writers, graders listening to this podcast. Yeah. Adult writers uh, and expert writers engage in a more complicated problem solving process where they have it so that you're basically doing this kind of like search through the knowledge that you have and search through kind of like a rhetorical form. Like, how am I going to present this? And it's this dual search process is like incredibly taxing. And it's why we have writer's block because sometimes you know something, but you don't know how to express it or you have a way to express it, but you're missing some knowledge or like, and so you're going back and forth, back and forth. back And, forth. and so even to like, just write, a really short essay. It takes a lot of work. And so I think one thing that differs from conversation is that what I'm doing right now is a lot more like the knowledge telling strategy. Just because I don't have time to compose, I am just saying things as they come to mind. And so if you transcribe it, it's not going to look that great. I don't think, well, maybe you'll read it and you'll like it, but I think it, it, you know, we're jumping around, we're switching topics. I start a point, I say, well, I'm going to talk about three things and I only talk about one of them because I have the limited working memory bandwidth. I can't keep track of everything. I am just saying things as they come to mind. Whereas when you're writing, I mean, you can write that way. There is stream of consciousness writing. Adults often write that way too. But if you're trying to write something good, you're usually trying to be like, well, what's the right way to open this? And what's the right way to explain this idea? This sentence is confusing. How do I say that again? And so it's the fact that you can edit. It's the fact that you can go over and rewrite and change it and think it again. That you just, like you have an ability that it's hard to do in, you know, extemporaneous speech where you're just like spouting off. Because you can edit, because you can do that, I think that's really hard. But I think it's that process of working through the idea space and the rhetorical space that like that's how you actually really understand something. You really get a good grasp of your talk of your subject is by constantly reworking it and being like, well, this, but this argument I'm making is weak or this thing is, this idea is wrong or are people going to understand this metaphor or, you know, are they, what is their, what is their viewpoint on this? And I think it's that thinking process that like, again, that's how you get to the signal because you've, you've thought it through, you've figured out the game plan so that when they're reading the essay, it looks like you just came out of the top of my head, but Every single move has been carefully plotted and, and even better writers are better at that than I am. So I think, you know, you can admire someone who has really good writing uh, for that reason. What have you found to be the best ways to overcome writer's block? Oh, I mean, writer's block can be difficult to deal with. I think my, my advice is that if you're struggling with writer's block, there's two things to think about. One thing is, is I actually, I have all the information. I just don't know how to proceed. And in that case, it's sometimes you need to dial back the problem solving. You need to go back into the like 
just write it as I was going to speak it and then edit it later. So that's a, you know, the first draft is crap and then you edit later because you can't actually do everything in one go and you have these really high standards for yourself. So you're constantly inhibiting what you're trying to say. So just say it and then write it. But I think in some cases, a lot of writer's block is I have writer's block because I don't have the knowledge I need to execute what I want to do. So I, I write mostly nonfiction. But I mean, that's often the case for me is that like, if I'm trying to write someone's story, for instance, like if I'm, you know, when I write books, I like to open with stories. And if I'm really struggling to open a story, often it's because I don't know enough about the subject. So I have a few moves I can make and I don't like any of them. And so that's where I'm like going back and forth between, well, I start with this, do I start with this, do I start with this? But if you had 10 moves, you could, you could maybe pick one. If you had more like possible things that are interesting, you can, you can pick one. Now, I don't want to say that knowing more, knowing more is always the right way to do it, but I think it's often a good way to approach things. Um, the, the science fiction writer, Octavia Butler had this really great advice that I like for this purpose. And she was saying, you know, if you have difficulty starting a story, for instance, she says, go get like 10 stories that you like and see how they started it. And she says, get 10, because we, if you just do one, you're just copying. But if you get 10, then you can sort of, you see the possibilities of this is how you could start this story. And uh, she has this uh, quote, which I'm going to paraphrase because I don't remember it verbatim, but something like, you know, as writers, we have this sort of ocean of possibilities, but we don't know how to like get from it what we need. And I think that's what it is. You need to know how to see the ocean, how to how to look for it and how to get what you need. And so I definitely think that, um, you know, if you're in the position where you're listening to me and you're getting writerly advice, uh, I think one problem can definitely be that you don't know enough about the subject yet. And so, uh, I am, I'm more in the favor of like, do more research than you think you need to, because very rarely is like, oh, this person did too much research, you know, like, uh, they know this subject too well. They shouldn't be writing this. Like, it's usually the opposite. They're like, oh, no, no, you, you're, you're trying to rush it. You're trying to get something out, but you don't actually understand it yet, or you don't have enough material yet, or you don't have, you don't have the thing that's interesting about it yet. And so good writers read a lot and they read a lot about what they're about to write. So that's my day. I love that. Morgan Housel talks about the idea of like, if it flows, and it comes easy, that's when his best pieces have come about. Mm. Maybe because his research has been on point or there he has a lot of knowledge about the topics that he's writing about. Has that also been true from your perspective? I don't know. I don't know. You know what? I think it's interesting. So there's a truth to that. Um, I have a guy that I work with and he's like, it's never the stuff that you think where like I'm working out an idea that is good. It's always the stuff where I'm saying where to me, it's too obvious to like, this is maybe even not worth saying. That's what he says. There's always the good stuff. And I think that's because the more expert you are in something, the more you can like write commandingly about it. And so I think there is a truth to that. So I don't, I don't want to deny that advice. I think if you just take given, given your writing, given what you know, the stuff that you, that comes easily to you is probably going to be better than the stuff that's really hard. But the question is, how do you get better as a writer? And I think it's doing the stuff that's hard that makes you better as a writer. It's doing the stuff that I, this is difficult. This is like hard for me to understand. This is hard for me to write. This is a difficult story. I want, what I want to do with this piece is not just like in my repertoire al already. That's the deliberate practice. And so I tend to think there's a trade off. If you're sort of like, right now, I want to produce at the moment, the best I can possibly do, you kind of want to be in a flow state. You want it to come as easily as possible. For the long term, I want to be the best writer I can be. I want to improve my craft. I think you will need to be in the like grinding state. And that's why um, Anders Ericsson, when he was proposing this theory of deliberate practice for all learning, he was suggesting you need to keep work and practice separate because work is always pushing you to be fluent and practice is, is not doing that. It's doing it like the hard way it's doing it where it's like, well, I'm not good at this. I'm failing. Um, I have to like, you know, inhibit the, the fluent response. And so I think, uh, there's probably some truth to that. Although in practice, I think we often end up having to merge it because we don't have, you know, hours a day to write essays that we're going to throw in the garbage. But I mean, like for me, I, I definitely feel like the, the doing the grinding practice. Yeah. You, it's not always your best writing, but it improves the quality of your effortless writing that you do later. What does practice look like for a writer? Well, it's writing, <laughs> first of all. But I think uh, <laughs> if I can be more specific than that, 
Um, there's lots of different elements of practice. I think practice is not a monolithic thing uh, in any domain. It's always a identification of something that's missing. So it's a, it's a focusing. It's like taking the broader activity and focusing on something. So like I was saying, you know, before I wrote my book, um, this ultra learning book, uh, you know, I'd never written like a traditionally published book before. And so I was a little nervous. So I actually went through books that is like, I remember liking this book. Let's look at it, not to read it, but to figure out what they did. Like, how did they structure the book? How was their writing? This kind of thing. And so that's a kind of practice. I'm not writing, but I'm doing a kind of analysis to be like, what is it that you're doing when you're writing this way? And often you discover things in that analytical sort of close reading mode that is different than you discover when you were first reading it. So one of my favorite ones is, I don't remember the author, but there was one author I was like, I really like this person because they have such great research. That was like my impression from them. They were very scholarly. And I read through the book again. And I'm like, they got like eight citations. So what was it that I was tapping into that I thought they were very scholarly? No, it was just they wrote in a scholarly way. It was just the tone of voice. It had nothing to do with citations. And I've read other books that they don't feel that way, even though the density of research is like incredible. Like this person's really done their homework, but they have a kind of a little bit too conversational kind of tone. It's a little bit too peppy and like, you know, and it, so it doesn't feel that way, but they actually have done their homework, which was an interesting intuition that like sometimes people can just be totally full of shit and <laughs> just because they're writing in a certain tone of voice. Um, and I think there was also times where I was like, I was looking at how they were doing stories. Like how long are their stories? How long do they wait before they transition? Like, you know, what kinds of stories are they using? What are they doing? And I think this is very, uh, like, it's an interesting exercise. So if, if you're trying to like, you know, if you're writing fiction, like go read Harry Potter again and just be like, what is JK Rowling doing? Cause like you maybe you liked Harry Potter and like, but you, you probably not realizing, oh, this is how she's doing it. This is how she's making a six year old or not six year old, maybe like a 10 year old read a 600 page book in a weekend. You know, this is how she's doing it. So I think that like that's, but that's one aspect of practice. Other practices like, um, you know, like one thing, I, the more recent book I wrote is that uh, I was writing, relying more on external stories. And so it was an exercise for me to be like, how do I write without constantly like leaning on my own opinion as the, as the source for this? Like I wanted to write in a way where, you know, I'm never just like saying lots of things and just throwing stuff out. This just, oh, this is just my opinion. This is just what I think, you know? Um, not that that's, like a bad way of writing, but just, it was a constraint for me of like trying to write in a way where it's sort of like, I'm going to make an assertion. How do I know that it's true? Right. And, and, and so I think that's, um, you know, that was a, that was itself a challenging kind of practice task because when you're blogging, you're just endlessly relying on your own opinion. And, and so it's a different way of doing it. So I think that's what practice looks like to me is it's, uh, you know, analyzing other writers, it's analyzing other prose, it's reading, it's, uh, trying to do something with your writing that you don't normally do. Yeah, it's fascinating to think about how sports has practice time and game time so mm -hmm. clearly mapped out, but so many professions don't. Like even business, there's no, when you have meetings yeah. for, in, in business or you have meetings like for your nine to five, you don't have actual practice for those meetings often. And that's a fascinating thing. I find. Well, you know what's funny? Um, so uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this because my upcoming book, I wrote a whole chapter where I was covering the research on it. And uh, wow. there's a lot of research that shows that like experts in a lot of areas are not that good. Like they're not, <laughs> I love sounds, this that because, sounds mean, but well, they're no, like, I love this. I love this yeah. because you previously mentioned 80%. If 80% of experts say something, it's probably true. Which is probably well. This that's exactly. more about knowledge. That's more like what do people who think about this think about this? I'm talking about like um, so. For instance, uh, you, like the, like a classic example would be like if you're a psychologist and you're offering like a parole decision. Like, will this criminal uh, reoffend? Right. This is a kind of it's, it's a task that you might have to do if you were in this sort of setting. And what they find is that if you just like like listed out their resume of like and just did a tally of like, this is in their favor, this is against them, and you just tallied it up, that actually does better than like three PhD holding psychologists who do like an hour long interview from them, which is crazy, right? Like you'd think wow. you have a lifetime of experience and all these theories of like, you can't do that. And I think the reason why, or the the explanation that I, I draw to there is, um, is that a lot of pr practitioners, a lot of uh, like of these kinds of experts who, who are relying on like a kind of judgment, um, 
they're not getting good feedback from their tasks. So they don't know whether they're making good decisions or not. And then at the same time, you know, what we were talking about, they're uh, like, we're not getting this sort of practice, this deliberate practice where you are, um, yeah, you're, you're actually like taking time out to hone this skill. You're just doing it, right? So you just, you get more and more fluent. This is the flow idea. You get more and more fluent, but you don't get better. So you just become, you can become more and more confident just saying your opinion, but you don't it's get It's easier to bullshit. It. Yeah. And so, um, so I, this is a particular class of, um, of expert judgment. And I think, uh, the idea sort of to go back to it is that like, yeah, maybe, maybe we should be training people more like athletes. And I think it's just because the way athletics is set up, it rewards that kind of model. But I mean, why wouldn't we want to have like our HR managers at a big fortune 500 company? A company engaged in some kind of hiring tournament where you're like scoring your hire, scoring the people you re- you like rejected, and you're getting some kind of score, and then you're doing some kind of practice mock interviews where you're working on your interview skills, and you know ho- why don't we do that? We don't do that, but why don't we do that? You know, we could do that. So I think um, you know that's another area where I think maybe our intuitions mislead us because we have this. Uh, this idea of ourselves as being really competent and like, if you do something regular, like, oh yeah, but you know, I, I have this judgment. I'm really good at picking job applicants and maybe you're not, (laughs) maybe you're not, but you don't know. Right. And so I think um, there's lots of areas where we could probably be more like athletes, be more like professional chess players, be more like, uh, you know, concert pianists in the way that we approach learning and skill acquisition, uh, that would be to our benefit. <laughs> yeah. I think just asking yourself that question, if you're listening to this, how could I treat my profession more like an athlete can lead yeah. you to an extraordinary place. Definitely. I, I like to end the, I could actually speak to you all day and I really <laughs> hope you come back on the podcast yeah. when you have your second book out sure. in uh, May of 2024. But before I let you go, I like to end these podcasts with challenges for the mm-hmm. audience or ask the guests for a challenge to leave someone listening with an action step that they can actually do from listening to us for an hour and a half. So does a challenge come to mind? Right. So uh, I, I like to keep these things whenever I give people homework. I like to keep it small and actual. But one thing I would say is just, you know, get a piece of paper, just get a pen and try to write out one thing that you'd like to learn and like a basic plan of how you would like to learn it. Now, this isn't like commit you to it. I know that, you know, you're busy and you don't have time. You're listening to this podcast while you're also cleaning the dishes and putting your kids to bed and driving to work. But I think just going through the mental exercise of being like, what is something I always wanted to learn? It could be a subject. It could be a skill. It could be a hobby. It could be a sport. It could be whatever. Right. And then what would be like the, okay, I'm going to devote myself, you know, part-time for the next three months, you know, full-time for two weeks on vacation to like get better at this. Doesn't have to be best in the world, just better at it. What would I do? I think that's a useful exercise. It's useful to keep in mind because I think we don't normally consider these kinds of projects, but you know, I think you, I, I think you want to be the kind of person where you always have projects that like they're in the background. Like, well, I want to do this one day. I want to do this one day. And even if you're busy, even if you don't have time to do it right away, I think it makes you a more interesting person if you are like, you know, you're excited to start some of these things. And so this would be the place to start. I think that's an amazing challenge. Thank you so much, Scott, for taking the time. Where should we send people to connect with you further? Sure. So you can check out my website, scotthyoung.com. And uh, you can also check out Ultra Learning if you Amazon, Audible, wherever you get your books from, you can check it out too. And uh, you can read more about the learning science that I cover in that book. Awesome. All linked below. Much love, Scott. I really appreciate you. you. You're an absolute legend. And (laughs) the the chunking that you've done throughout this conversation (laughs) has just led me down to so many rabbit holes that I'm excited to explore. So I appreciate you for all of the writing, all of the wisdom and, and everything you, you put out into the world. It really makes a difference. Thank you so much.